An array of two byte integers is stored in big Indian machine in byte address as shown below. What will be its storage pattern in little Indian machine? The address of 104 has value 78, 103 56, 102 34, and 101 12. And this is the big Indian representation. Going by the definition of little Indian, the least significant bit would be stored in the lower level address. Also, the two byte integers is being stored. So these two addresses would correspond to one single word, and the next two addresses would correspond to the next word. And by the definition of little Indian, the address of 101 would contain the least significant bit of this word. So 101 would contain the least significant bit that is 34 and 102 would contain 12. And for the next word 103 that is the lower level address would contain the least significant bit that is 78 and 104 would contain the next value that is 56. And going by the options, option C is the correct answer. This is a previous year ISRO question. A non-pipeline CPU has 12 general purpose registers, R0 to R12. It supports the following two operations, add RA, RB, RR. It means that RA is added to RB and the result is stored in RR. Multiply RA, RB, RR. It means that the value of RA is multiplied by RB and result is stored in RR. And multiplication operation has two clock cycle. Addition has one clock cycle. And the question is to compute minimum number of clock cycles to evaluate this particular expression. That is xy plus xyz plus yz. The registers R0, R1 and R2 has the following values of x, y and z. That is x, R1 has value y and R2 has value z. And the condition is that these register values of R0, R1 and R2 cannot be modified. So first of all, what is the thing that can be noticed? xy plus x y z plus y z yes y is common across all the expressions so x plus x z plus z now how many operations are needed x so we are having addition and we are having multiplication first operation would be to multiply x into z so we have one multiplication next step would be to add the result of these two that is one addition would be here and the next step would be to add the result of these two so one more addition operation and the finally we have to multiply this result so one more multiplication in total two addition and two multiplication and multiplication takes two clock cycle and addition takes one clock cycle so two multiplication taking two clock cycle and two addition taking one clock cycle it means 6. So the minimum number of clock cycles required is 6. Option B is the correct answer. This is a previous year ISRO question. The minimum number of NAND gates required to implement the expression A bar plus B bar into C plus D. Based on the De Morgan's law, A bar plus B bar equal to AB the whole bar. We are rewriting it as AB the whole bar into C plus a B the whole bar into D. Now applying the law of double negation. Double negation means that the expression value remains unchanged as we are double negating it. So applying double negation A B the whole bar into C plus A B the whole bar into D and then double negating it. Then again applying De Morgan's law, we can rewrite it as A B the whole bar into C the whole bar dot a b the whole bar into d the whole bar followed by the second negation this can be implemented using four nand gates that is a and b a b the whole bar so we are implementing this a b the whole bar then using that as output and one more input c we can make a b the whole bar into c the whole bar this would be essentially this whole expression now next we already have this a b the whole bar output here then using d as next input we can rewrite it as d we will be getting this whole expression and then again using one more NAND gate 
and this as assume this as input x and this as input y then we are writing it as x y the whole bar that is we are again using one more NAND gate using these two outputs as the input so ultimately we will get this NAND gate and the answer is 4 this is a previous series row question if ABCD is a 4 bit binary number then what is the code generated by the following circuit looking at the circuit we can identify it as a binary to a gray code converter and the output for the binary to gray code converter would be w equal to a x is a x or b y is b x or c and z is c x or d so this is an example of a binary to a gray code converter so the correct option is b this is a previous year ISRO question. We are asked to calculate the total number of tokens in the following C code segment. Starting from switch, it will be 1, open bracket would be 2, input value would be 3, close bracket would be 4, curly brace would be 5, case would be 6, 1 would be 7, colon would be 8, B would be 9, equal to will be 10, C will be 11, multiplication would be 12, D would be 13, semicolon would be 14, break would be 15 semicolon would be 16 default would be 17 colon would be 18 b would be 19 equal to would be 20 b would be 21 plus plus would be 22 semicolon would be 23 break would be 24 semicolon would be 25 and closed curly brace would be 26 so the total number of tokens here is 26 this is a previous series of question in a two-pass assembler, resolution of subroutine calls and inclusion of labels in the simple table is done during which phase? This is like a memory-based question. So, in two-pass assembler, during the first phase, the labels are included in the simple table and the subroutine calls are resolved in the second pass. So, the answer to this question is option C, which is in second pass, the subroutine calls are resolved and in the first pass, the labels are included in the simple table. This is a previous year ISRO question. What is the in order successor of 15 in the given binary search tree? The in order successor of a node in a binary search tree can be defined as the smallest key whose value is greater than the current input node. So here the in order successor of 15 in binary search tree is 17 because the smallest key that is greater than the current input node is 17 here. This is a previous year ISRO question. The minimum height of an AVL tree with n nodes are. So, first of all, what is AVL tree? AVL tree is a self balancing binary search tree. In AVL tree, the height of two children subtree of any node differ by at most one. So, let's consider the four options and find out what is the minimum height of an AVL tree. So, suppose n is equal to 5. So, n is equal to 5. Let's draw the AVL tree with minimum height. This is node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4, and node 5. And assume the definition of height as follows height is the number of levels in a tree. So this is level 1, this is level 2, and this is level 3. So, going by the definition, the number of levels in a tree is equal to height. The height is equal to 3 here. Now, let's consider all of the options. Option A, seal of log n plus 1. Log n plus 1 here is 6. Log of n plus 1. 5 plus 1 is 6. And the seal, that is the upper bound. Here we have seal of 6 equal to 2.58. So, we have seal is equal to 3. Second option is 1.44 log n. 1.44 log n would yield a value of 3.72. 3.72. That is 1.44 log n. Option B. And the next option is floor of log n plus 1. So here the floor value of 2.58 will be equal to 2. And the last option is 1.64 log to the base 2 of n which would yield a value of 
two three. This is one point four four log to the base two of n. So going by the options, we have log of n plus one and the seal value. So option A is the correct answer. This is a previous ISRO question. The question asks us to find out which is the correct statement among the four given options. The master's theorem assumes the subproblems are unequal sizes. This option is wrong. It can be used if the subproblems are of equal size. Yes, master's theorem assumes that the subproblems are of equal size. It cannot be used for divide and conquer algorithms. This is false. Master's theorem can be used to find the time complexity of divide and conquer algorithms such as merge sort. And it cannot be used for asymptotic complexity analysis. This option is also false. So the correct option is option B. It can be used if the subproblems are of equal size. This is a previous ISRO question. It is regarding the Raymond's tree based algorithms. So what is a Raymond's tree based algorithm? Yes, it is a log based algorithm for mutual exclusion in a distributed system such that a site is allowed to enter the critical section if it has a token. It creates a directed tree with edges of the tree are assigned direction towards the site that helps the token. As it creates a tree, there is no cycle possible. So there is no deadlock involved in this. But the site can enter the critical section on receiving the token even when the request is not on top of the request queue. As a result, starvation to processes can occur. So the correct option is no deadlock but starvation may occur. And the option B is the correct answer. This is a previous ISRO question. Which of the following algorithm defines time quantum? And the options given are shortest job scheduling algorithm, round robin scheduling algorithm, priority scheduling algorithm, and multi level queue scheduling algorithm. And going by the options, we can see that round robin scheduling algorithm uses the concept of time quantum. So the correct option is option B. In round robin scheduling algorithm, the processes are scheduled to CPU based on a specific time quantum that is decided by the round robin scheduler. So option B is correct. This is a previous ISRO question. Dispatch latency is defined as A. The speed of dispatching a process from running to the ready state. B. The time of dispatching a process from running to ready state and keeping the CPU idle. C. The time to stop one process and start running another one. D. None of this. First of all, what is a dispatcher? A dispatcher is a special software that is responsible for moving a process from ready state to the running state. And going by the options, dispatch latency may be defined as the time to stop one process and to start running another one. And option C is the correct answer. This is a previous ISRO question. An aid to determine deadlock occurrences A. Resource allocation graph, B. Starvation graph, C. Inversion graph, and D. None of the above. A resource allocation graph is a special type of graph in which processes are denoted in a circle and the resources that are allocated to it or requested are denoted in a square bracket. And a direct edge from process to a particular resource denotes that a particular process has requested a resource and a direct edge from resource to process denotes that the resource has been allocated to the process. And a resource allocation graph is used to determine deadlock occurrence. So option A is the correct option. This is a previous ISRO question. Consider the following page reference string that is given here. What are the minimum number of frames required to get a single page fault for the above sequence assuming a large replacement strategy? Some of the points to note here are minimum number of frames to get a single page fault and the replacement strategy used is LRU. So in LRU replacement strategy, the page which is least recently used is replaced. So now going by the options, we'll test with option number four. That is four frames. One, two, three, and four. So one, it will be hit placed here. Two, three, four. And again, we are going for page number two. So it is already here. Page number one, it is already here. Now page number five, it causes page fault. So we have to replace one page among the four to put five. So one is recent used, two is recent used, four is recent used. So three is the least recent used. So we replace. 3 with 5. Then again, page 6 causes a page fault. So we stop here because we required only one single page fault. So option C is not the correct answer. Now we go for option 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now the pages are 1, 2, 
3 4 now 2 is hit 1 is also hit and page 5 it can be placed here and page 6 causes a page fault so page 6 causes a page fault we have to replace page 6 with one of the frames so the least recently used here is 5 is already there 1 is already here 2 is already here 4 is already here so 3 will be again replaced so 3 will be replaced with 6 now again going back here 2 1 2 3 7 7 causes a page fault here so option 5 is also not the correct answer now going by option 6 we have 6 frames 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 and we'll start again we'll put frame number 1 2 3 4 2 is a hit and 1 is also hit and we'll put page number 5 then we'll put page number 6 also now 2 1 2 3 all these are there in the page frame 7 it again causes a page fault so we have to replace 7 in the page frames with another page that is 3 cannot be placed 2 1 also cannot be used 6 5 4 4 is the one which is least recently used so we replace 4 with 7 so as of now only one page fault has occurred 6 is there 3 is there 2 is there 1 2 3 6 all the frames are there so the minimum number of frames which causes a single page fault is c option 6 This is a previous year ISRO question. Three CPU bound tasks with execution times of 15, 12, and 5 operating units arrive at the times 0, T, and 8 respectively. If the operating system implements shortest remaining time for scheduling algorithm, what should be the value of T to have four contact switches? Ignore the contact switches at time T equal to 0 and at the end. And we are given four options A. 0 less than T less than 3. B. T equal to 0. C. T less than or equal to 3. D 3 less than T less than 8. So assume first option. So let's take T equal to 2. Now we have taken T is equal to 2. So we have the time as follows. We have three process and their arrival time and burst time when T equal to 2. Arrival time is 0, 2, and 8 and the burst times are 15 12 and 5 now let's draw the gantt chart for this this is the gantt chart we are drawing so initially at time t equal to 0 only process 1 comes so it runs for how many units let assume it runs for two units so now process this is p0 p1 and p2 and we have 15 units of time here 12 units of time here and 5 units of time here. So at time t equal to 2, till that time the process P0 runs. So they have we, we have remaining 13 units. So now a contact switch happens and the shortest remaining time is 12. Now P1 runs and the process P1 runs till 8 units of time when another process comes. So that process time has a burst time of 5 and 12 minus how much we have here uh, 6 minus 8 minus 2 equal to 6, uh, 6 so for 6 unit it runs so here the time would be 6 and uh, so it will be running till 8 the next contact switch happens so p2 will be contact switched so p2 will be running till 13 units of time after this is over now p1 would be running so another contact switch happens so P1 would be running till 19 units of time. Then after that, another contact switch happens. Then P0 would be running. So till 32. So we are asked to ignore the contact switch at the beginning and end. So here we have 1, 2, 3, and 4. Here this delta symbol is the contact switch. It is just a symbol to denote contact switch. So we have four contact switches here. So option A can be considered a correct answer, but let's explore uh, some more options. So for option A, we have four contact switch. Now we move on to the other option that is T equal to zero. For T equal to zero, we'll be having that is the 
table would be as follows. Both process P0 and P1 arrive at time t equal to 0 and the third process would come at time 8 and the burst times would be 15, 12 and 5. P0, P1, P2 are arrival time. This is burst time. So now let's consider at time t equal to 0. What happens is P1 runs because it is having the minimum amount of time. Let's draw the time period. P0 is having 15, P1 is having 12 and P2 is having 5. So P1 runs till the whole time because at time 8, at time 8 P2 comes. At t equal to, at time 8 the process P2 comes but now 12 minus 8 we have 4. So 5 is greater than 4. So the P1 process runs till 12 units. Then a contact switch happens. So this is completed. Now we have process P2 that will be put into the queue and it will be running till 17 unit. Next we have P0. So it will be contact switch and it will be running till 32 units of time. So at t equals 0 we have only 3 contact switches. So it cannot be the right option. So let's consider the next option that is t less than t less than 8. Assume t is equal to 5. So we have the following. Uh, draw the time as follows. So arrival time followed by burst time. We have P0, P1 and P2. So here 0, here 5 and here 8. We have 15, 12 and 5. Now let's draw the tree. I mean the Gantt chart. So at P0 till 5 units the process P0 runs. Then when we compare at t equal to 5 again uh, P0 only would be running. So P0 would be running till 8. Then next a contact switch happens. Then the process P3 would be running till 5 more units. So at 13. Then again the process P1 would be running till the time 20. Then again another contact switch happens and completely the process P3 runs. So sorry it wouldn't be P0 it will be P0 would be running. So we have three contact switches here. So going by the options the correct answer is option A. So we have four contact switches here. This is a previous year ISRO question. Context free languages are closed under which of the following options? Yes, first of all, what is a context free language? A context free language is a language which is accepted by a pushdown automata. And what are closure properties? Closure properties is a technique which helps us to identify the class of a resulting language when we do two operations on language of same classes. So here there are four options given. And first of all, Let's check intersection part. We know that intersection and complement are not closed in context free languages. The complement of a context free language need not be context free. Similarly, intersection of a context free language need not be context free. So using these two properties, we can cut the option of intersection as well as complement as well as complement here. So the correct option is the context free languages are closed under union and clean closure. This is a previous year ISRO question. Which of the following options is true? Option A. Every subset of a regular set is regular. This is false. Let us consider the language L equal to A star followed by B star. This is a regular language. And a subset of this language is A power n, B power n, where n greater than or equal to 0. Here we need a stack to compare the number of A's as well as number of B's. So this is a context free language. So this is not regular. So this option is false. Consider the second option. Every finite subset of a non-regular set is regular. Yes, this is true. Since we are having the word finite, the finiteness can be associated with a regular language. 
so this option is true now itself we can stop but let's move on to the other two options the union of two non regular set is not regular consider this two language that is a power n b power m where n less than or equal to m this is a non regular language and another non regular language a power n b power m where n greater than m the union of these two languages will be a star b star so this a star b star is a regular language so this option is also false and consider the fourth option infinite union of finite set is regular consider a finite set that is 0 and the finite set 0 1 and the finite set 0 0 1 1 and so on this all are finite set so this all are regular but infinite union it would lead to 0 power n followed by 1 power n this would always leads to a context free language so this is also not regular so the correct option is option b this is a previous year isro question which of the following is true the first one is this is a previous year isro question the language which is generated by the grammar s derives asa or b s b or a or b over the alphabet a comma b is the set of which of the following let's see the strings which are generated by the grammar the minimum length string that is generated is a comma b and we cannot generate a a or b b so the next minimum length string is a a a b b b b a b a b a these are some of the strings which are generated by the above grammar so from the options we can rule out even length palindromes because the grammar always generates odd length string and the next option b can also be ruled out because even length string is mentioned and option a can also be ruled out because they are just mentioning strings that begin and end with same symbol this is correct these are the strings which begin and end with same symbol but even length string are also included if we consider option a so option c is the correct answer which of the following classes of languages can validate the ipv4 address in dotted decimal format it is to be ensured that the decimal values are between 0 and 255 and the options are regular expression and higher context free grammar and higher context sensitive grammar and higher recursively enumerable language the correct answer is option a regular expression and higher this is because we need to ensure that the value lie between 0 and 255 as the number of decimal values are finite the correct option is regular expression and higher so why regular expression and higher is correct because based on the hierarchy the closest one is regular expression and the next one is context free grammar and the next one would be context sensitive grammar and the next one is recursively enumerable language so using regular expression we can generate it This is a previous year isro question. Minimum number of states required in DFA accepting binary strings ending in 101. So, first construct a DFA accepting strings ending in 101. That is in the initial state Q0. Upon seeing input 1, we move on to next state Q1. Then upon seeing input 0, we move to next state Q2. then upon seeing input 1 we reach the final state that is qf now since it's a dfa let's fill the remaining transitions here in state q0 upon seeing any number of zeros we loop upon seeing any number of ones in q1 we loop then in q2 upon seeing 1 we move to next state qf and upon seeing zero the whole transition is broken so we again move on to the initial state that is q0 then in the final state qf upon seeing one we move on to state q1 and upon seeing zero we move on to state q2 so this is the dfa that accepts strings ending in 101 
ending in 101 now the complement of this dfa would be accepting binary strings not ending in 101 to find a complement we just exchange the final state and the non final states so the complement of the dfa would be q0 it will be the final state q1 it will be also a final state q2 this also will be final state and qf it will not be the final state it will be a non final state and the transitions remain same that is upon seeing 0 it will be looping on seeing 1 it will be moving here on seeing 1 it will be looping on 0 it will be moving here upon 1 it will move here on seeing 0 it will move to q2 on seeing 1 it will move to q1 upon seeing 0 it will move to q0 this is the dfa which accept binary strings not ending in 101 so the total number of states are 1 2 3 4 and this is the minimal so option b is the correct answer this is a previous restore question which of the following is a type of out of order execution with the reordering done by a compiler option a loop unrolling here we optimize the execution time by removing loop control and loop test instruction there is no out of order execution option a is not the correct answer option b dead code elimination here we remove the code which do not affect the program result here also there is no out of order execution option b is also not the correct answer option c strength reduction here expensive operation are replaced by less expensive but equivalent operations here also there is no out of order execution so option d is the correct answer in software pipelining we optimize loop similar to hardware pipelining but the out of order execution is done with the help of a compiler so option d is the correct answer this is a previous istro question one instruction tries to write an operand before it is written by previous instruction this may lead to dependency called a true dependency b anti dependency c output dependency d control hazard what is true dependency it is also called read after write dependency consider the instruction i1 that is load r1 comma a and the instruction i2 that is add r2 comma r1 comma r1 in this instruction i2 should read the value of r1 only after it is written by instruction i1 so this is not what the question tries to find so option a is not the right answer option b anti dependency also called as var right after read dependency consider an example i1 that is multiply r1 comma r2 comma r3 instruction i2 that is add r2 comma r4 comma r5 so in write after read dependency or anti dependency the value of r2 that is here these two here the instruction i1 should read first then only the instruction i2 should write so this is also not what the question asks and consider the third option that is output dependency also called as write after write dependency an example would be add r2 comma r1 comma r3 mul or multiply r2 comma r4 comma r5 so here this instruction that is i1 should write first before this instruction writes to the value of r2 so there is a dependency between instruction i1 and R i2 such that one instruction is trying to write an operand before it is written by previous instruction so here there is an output dependency and this is what the question asks so the option c is the correct answer and option d control hazard it is related to those dependencies which are caused by branch instruction and this is also not the correct answer so option c is the correct answer
This is a previous register question. If every non-key attribute is functionally dependent on the primary key, then the relation will be in first normal form, second normal form, third normal form, or fourth normal form. Assume the relation R and having attributes A, B, and C. Let's assume the functional dependencies as A derives B, B derives C, as well as A derives C. In the question, it is not mentioned that non-prime attribute is only dependent on primary key. So the functional dependency B derives C is perfectly valid. As a result, the result of the relation is in 2NF but not in 3NF because of every non-key attribute is transitively dependent on the primary key and A is the candidate key here. Candidate key. So, option B, second normal form is the correct answer. This is a previous restore question. We are given an SQL query and we are asked to find what it returns. So the query is select columns from table A, right outer join table B on A dot column name equal to B dot column name where A dot column name is null. So the first point we have to note here is that we are first doing A outer join B. In this process, all rows of B which are failed to match with any rows of A are also included in the result where all A's columns are set to null. Secondly, we are imposing a condition on A by comparing column name to null. So we are getting all rows where A dot column name equal to null, which are nothing but B's table rows, which are failed to match with any row of A. So ultimately, this should fetch all rows where B is not matching with any row of A. So none of the options here are matching. This is actually a question which, are ex which was excluded for evaluation. So there is some issue with the question. So none of the options matches. This is a previous issue question. To set same bit sequence, non return to zero encoding requires same clock frequency as Manchester encoding, half the clock frequency as Manchester encoding, twice the clock frequency as Manchester encoding, a clock frequency which depends on number of zeros and ones in the bit sequence. So, first of all, what is a non return to zero encoding? This is an encoding technique in which the voltage level remains constant during a bit interval. And what is Manchester encoding? In Manchester encoding, there is a transition after every bit in the voltage level. So, to send the same bit sequence in non return to zero, we require half the clock frequency as of Manchester encoding. So, option B is the right answer. This is a previous restore question. The process timer in TCP is used to which of the following options? So, first of all, let's understand the concept of persist timer. It is used in TCP to deal with the zero window size issue. So, first of all, let's assume that there is no persist timer in TCP and what happens when we are dealing with the zero window size. This is the sender and this is the receiver. The receiver sends a zero window size as an acknowledgement. Now, the sender assumes that the receiver has no capacity to receive the frames and sender does not send any new packets. Now, after some time, receiver sends a new updated segment with the updated window size, but this segment is lost. Now, the sender is waiting for this segment and the receiver is waiting for data from the sender. This causes a deadlock condition because both are waiting. To avoid this, we use a persist timer. In persist timer, what happens is that the sender and receiver are here, that is sender and receiver, now when receiver sends a zero window size as acknowledgement, the sender starts a persistent timer. After the persistent timer, even if the sender does not receive any updated acknowledgement, the sender sends a probe segment with one byte of data. Once the receiver receives this probe segment, it again sends the updated window size. Now if the window size is zero, again 
the sender will start the persist timer. If it receives an updated video size other than zero, then sender starts sending the packet. So in order to avoid the deadlock condition, the persist timer is used in TCP. So option C is the correct answer. This is a previous ISRO question. Remote procedure calls are used for which of the following options? Actually, the options given are a bit ambiguous. But first of all, let's see what is an RPC. It is a form of inter-process communication such that different processes have different address space. Even if they are on same host machine, they differ in virtual address even if the physical address is same. And if they are on different host, they differ in the physical address. So going by this definition, both option A and option C can be the correct answer. That is, communication between two processes remotely different from each other on the same host as well as communication between two processes on two separate hosts. Both the options are correct. This is a previous series row question. Consider the following recursive C function which take two arguments n, r and if n greater than 0, it returns n mode r plus function call of n by r, r. If it is less than 0 or equal to 0, then it returns 0. And we are asked to calculate the value of RER of 513,2. So let's calculate. So first of all, 513,2, we get 513 mode 2. The answer is 1 plus half of 513 is 256,2. Then again calling 256 mode 2 is 0 plus half of 256 is 128,2. Again calling 128 mode 2 is 0, half of 128 is 64. Again calling 64 mode 2 is 0 plus half of 64 is 32 comma 2. Then again calling half of 60 half of 32 is 16 and 32 mode 2 is 0 plus 16 comma 2. Then again calling 16 mode 2 is 0 plus half of 16 is 8 comma 2. Again recursively calling 8 mode 2 is 0 plus half of 8 is 4 4 comma 2. Recursively calling 4 mode 2 is 0, half of 4 is 2. Again, recursively calling 2 mode 2 is 0, half of 2 is 1. Recursively calling 1, comma 2. 1 mode 2 is 1 and half of 1 will get 0 and we'll call 0, comma 2. Now, when 0, comma 2 is called, n is greater than 0, function fails and we get the return value 0. And then recursively calling back, it calculates the sum of this whole value. That is from here. till the sum of these values. So it returns 1 plus 1 equal to 2. So 2 is the correct answer. And option C, sorry, option D is the correct answer. Option D. This is a previous ISRO question. A grammar is said to be ambiguous if and four options are given. So first of all, what is an ambiguous grammar? A grammar is said to be ambiguous if it has more than one leftmost derivation for a particular sentence or more than one rightmost derivation for a particular sentence or more than one parse tree for a particular sentence. So going by the options A, option A, two or more productions have the same non-terminal on the left hand side. This is not the criteria. A derivation tree has more than one associated sentence. This is not at all possible. Using a particular derivation tree, we can generate only one sentence. So this option is also wrong. There is a sentence with more than one derivation tree corresponding to it. Yes, this is the option which satisfies the criteria of having more than one parse tree. So option C is the correct answer. This is a previous year ISRO question. We are given a particular code and we are asked to identify what it returns. So we have a character array named name and it is including satellites. And we have two integer variables length and size and length stores str len or length of that particular character array size store the size of that particular character array and we are asked to find out the product of len into size so first of all name this array would contain the following s a t e l l i t E, S, and ultimately there will be a null character. So, strlen it essentially calculates the length of the string. So, to calculate the length of the string, we'll be calculating till this point only. So, we are having 
10 characters if you are counting from index 0 then the index would be 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 so len would be storing the value of 10 because we are counting from 0 to 9 so the length is 10 and size is storing the size of this particular character array. so size of would store the string length plus the null character so size would be having the value 11 so we are asked to find the product so 10 into 11 we get 110 so option b is the correct answer this is a previous register question regression testing is related to a functional testing b development testing c data flow testing and d maintenance testing so first of all what is regression testing it is a testing done to make sure new code changes do not affect the existing functionality it ensures that the old code works even when the latest code changes are done so this is done related to the maintenance of the software so option d maintenance testing is the correct answer this is a previous year ISRO question of the following sort algorithms which has execution time that is least dependent on the initial ordering of the input let's see the options option a insertion sort insertion sort gives the best case time complexity when the input is sorted so it has a dependency on the initial ordering option b quick sort quick sort gives the worst case time complexity when the input is sorted so there is also a dependency on the initial ordering option d selection sort selection sort give least number of swaps if the input is sorted so here also there is a dependency but for option c merge sort it is independent of the initial ordering of the input it gives a time complexity of n log n always so option c merge sort is the correct answer this is a previous year ISRO question the following circuit compares two bit binary numbers x and y represented as x1 x0 and y1 y0 respectively where x0 and y0 represents the least significant bits under what condition z will be 1 and the conditions are x greater than y x less than y x equal to y and x not equal to y let's explore each of the options option a x greater than y and the numbers are x1 x0 these are the two bits of x 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 and y y1 y0 0 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 let's take the condition x equal to 2 and y equal to 0 so x equal to 2 means this and y equal to 0 means this so either this input or this input should be 1 for z to be 1 so let's consider this input path so x1 is what here x1 is 1 here and y1 bar y1 bar is also 1 here 1 into 1 1 so here z will be equal to 1 so x greater than y condition is satisfied so ideally x less than y condition will not be satisfied so now we have to check for x equal to y condition so assume x equal to y equal to 0 we have x1 x0 0 0 and x1 and y1 y0 as 0 0 now let's check the conditions we have x1 as 0 here so whatever value goes into this this input part will be 0 now let's check this input path so x0 is 0 here so now whatever input path here also it will be 0 so we will get z equal to 0 only in this case so x equal to y condition is also dissatisfied so option a x greater than y is the correct answer this is a previous year ISRO question what is the availability of the software with the following reliability figures mean time between failures is 20 days and mean time to repair is 20 hours and the options are 90 percentage 96 percentage 24 percentage and 50 percentage so first of all what is mean time between failures it is the average time between failures mean time to repair it is the downtime between two successive repairs and the formula for availability is as follows that is mean time between failures divided by mean time between failures plus 
mean time to repair. So we have mean time between failures in days and mean time to repair in hours. So let's convert this 20 days in, into hours. So we have 20 into 24 as we have 24 hours in a day divided by 20 into 24 plus 20. So we have 480 divided by 500 which gives 0 0.96 and in percentage 96 percentage. So option B is the correct answer. This is a previous ISRO question. What is the defect rate for Six Sigma? 1 defect per million lines of code, 1.4 defect per million lines of code, 3 defects per million lines of code, 3.4 defects per million lines of code. So first of all, what is Six Sigma? Six Sigma is used in statistical quality control which evaluates process capability. It produces a defect free product 99.99966% of time allowing only 3.4 error per million opportunity. So the defect rate for Six Sigma is option D 3.4 defects per million lines of code. This is a previous ISRO question. A stack is implemented with an array of size n and the index range from 0 to n minus 1 and there is a variable pause. Push and pop operations are defined below. While pushing an element, we push the element x into the array index by pause, then we decrement the value of pause. While popping, we increment the value of pause, then we return that particular value. This is how push and pop works. And we are asked to find the initializing value of pause such that we can get an empty stack with a capacity of n. So let's draw the stack first. This would be the stack with the index ranging from 0 to n minus 1. This would be 0 and this would be n minus 1. Now we can understand from the code that pop increments the pause and push decrements the pause. Also the stack grows from larger to lower index. That is the growth of stack is like this. So to have n elements in the stack, the initial value of pause should be pointing to n minus 1. So the pause should be pointing to initially n minus 1 this index because while pushing an element we can push it here and we can grow the stack downwards and suppose at some point of time while popping an element we can increment the value of pause to here and then we can pop the element. So the correct option is option D pause should be initialized to n minus 1. This is a previous ISRO question. B of A means A is a bear. F of A means A is a fish. E of A comma B means A it's B. Then what is the best meaning of for all X F of X implies for all Y E of Y comma X implies B of Y. So rewriting the expression once again for all X F of X implies for all Y E of Y comma X implies B of Y. So what is the concept of this particular statement? It states that all the times when x is a fish, if x is eaten by something, then that something has to be a bear. This is what it means. Simplifying that, it can be said that if anyone eats fish, then that anyone has to be a bear. So if anyone eats fish, then that anyone has to be bear. We can again simplify it as only bears eat fish. So option D is the correct answer. This is a previous ISRO question. We are given a declaration of an array of struct and assumes the following that is short int byte and long and their corresponding sizes are given. Short is of size 2, int is of size 3, byte is of size 1 and long is of size 4. And alignment rules stipulate that n byte field must be located at an address that is divisible by n. Also, the fields in the struct are not rearranged. Padding is ensured to have alignment and the all elements of the array should be of same size. So 
what will be the value of c of 10 and assuming that c is located at an address that is divisible by 8 the total size of c in bytes are and the options are given so the total size of this structure is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 which is 10 bytes and the criteria given here is that the address that is located by c should be divisible by 8 so to have an address that is divisible by 8 then address should be a multiple of 8 so the next closest byte that is a multiple of 8 is 16 so the total structure should be of size 16 bytes and we are given an array of c of 10 so 10 such locations are needed so 16 into 10 we have 160 so the total size is 160 bytes this is a previous year's row question we are given a procedure and the procedure is integer procedure p of x comma y and two integers are declared x comma y and there is a value x k equal to 5 l equal to 8 p equal to x plus y and x is called by value called by value and y is called by name called by name these two it refers to these two so this following function is invoked by k equal to 0 l equal to 0 and z is equal to p of k comma l what would be the return value of z so first of all what is called by value in called by value the values of the actual parameters are copied to the functions formal parameters and the changes to the value in function does not reflect in the actual parameter now what is called by name in called by name it is simply replacing the formal parameter with the actual parameter so x is called by value and we are calling the function here p of x p of k comma l so x would be having this value of k and y since it's, it is called by name we will simply replace it with l so x is called by value so x will be having the value of 0 and y is called by name so we simply pass the expression so y is replaced with l here so going into the code we have p of 0 which is x that is called by value and l as it is called by name now we have k equal to 5 and l equal to 8 and the p is summed up as x plus y here x plus y is as follows here x would be 0 because this particular value of x is assigned as 0 and the other value y is directly replaced by l so what is l here l is equal to 8 here so we have p equal to 8 so this function returns 8 and z would have the value of 8 so option b is the correct answer this is a previous history question Consider the product of three matrices M1, M2, and M3, and the dimensions of M1 are W rows and X columns, M2 is X rows and Y columns, and M3 is having Y rows and Z columns. The basic criteria for matrix multiplication is as follows. Suppose M1 matrix is having N1 rows and N2 columns, and M2 matrix is having N2 rows and N3 columns then the column of the first matrix and the row of the second matrix should be same to have matrix multiplication and the product matrix would be of the dimension n1 cross n3 and the total number of multiplications would be n1 n2 n3 remember these two points now our first task is to calculate m1 m2 then followed by m3 we know that m1 and m2 are having dimensions wx and xy so going by this this will create a product of m1 m2 will create a multiplication product having w x y now the product of m1 m2 will be of the dimensions w y and m3 is a matrix of dimension y z now this m1 m2 multiplied by m3 this would require how many multiplications we need w y z multiplications so in total m1 m2 followed by m3 would be requiring wxy plus 
y z number of multiplications this is equation number 1 now moving to the second matrix multiplication cost of m1 followed by m2 m3 what will be the total number of multiplication and its cost m2 m3 will have a multiplication cost of x y z this is for m2 m3 now the product of m2 m3 product of m2 followed by m3 will be of dimension x z and when multiplying it with m1 the multiplication would be m1 m2 m3 that would give w x y so in total m1 into m2 m3 will be giving us a total multiplication of x y z plus w x y this is the second one now assume this as follows that is to have a lesser time of computation the constraint is that w x y plus w y z should be having less than x y z plus w x y divide this equation by w x y z we will be getting w x y by w x y z plus w y z by w x y z will be less than x y z by w x y z plus w x y by w x y z this will give us a value of as follows that is which is equal to 1 by z plus 1 by x is less than 1 by w plus 1 by z and going by the option option b is the correct answer this is a previous year isro question a new flip flop with inputs x and y has the following property which of the following expresses the next state in terms of x y and current state so here we are given two inputs x and y as well as the current state and we have to find the expression which best describes the next state so let's first of all construct a truth table based on the given input we have to draw the truth table based on the current state as well as the input values so for let's construct the truth table here the inputs include x y and the current state can be denoted as q n and the next state which will be the output is denoted as q n plus 1 now based on the inputs we have 0 0 and q so q can be 0 or 1 so for 0 0 and q 0 as well as 0 0 and q 1 what will be the output for 0 0 if any value of q the next state is 1 so both values are 1 here next is 0 1 0 1 and q can be 0 or 1 so we have 0 1 0 0 1 and 1 so for the current q value the output will be q bar so here it will be q is 1 q bar would be q is 0 q bar would be 1 then q is 1 q bar would be 0 for the next case is 0 1 0 and q whatever it is q will be q n plus 1 will be also the same so 1 0 0 it will be 0 1 0 1 it will be 1 and for 1 1 we have 1 1 0 1 and 1 1 1 for 1 1 1 whatever is q next state would be 0 so both cases are 0 here so this is the truth table now let's construct a k map and use this to derive the expression so drawing the k map so this should be the how a three variable k map would look like and the values are here it would be x and here it would be y q n and the inputs will be 0 1 0 0 0 1 1 1 and the values are for 0 0 0 it will be 1 and for next value 0 0 1 also it will be 1 then 0 1 1 1 what is the value it will be 0 and 010 010 it will be 1 following this next we will be filling this entries it will be 0 1 1 and 0 now solving the k map these two can be grouped and this and this can be grouped so minimizing this expression we will be getting x will be cancelled out for 0 1 we will be having y bar Q n 
plus for this expression x will be having x bar into this will be cancelled out and q n bar so y bar q n plus x bar q n bar this will be the answer option a x bar q plus y bar q is the correct answer this is a previous registro question the immediate addressing mode can be used for one loading internal registers with initial values perform arithmetic or logical operation on data contained in instruction so first of all what is immediate addressing mode in immediate addressing mode the operand value is mentioned explicitly in the instruction itself consider some of the examples here we have load r1 comma value 100 here r1 is loaded with the value 100 and the instruction is add i i refers to immediate r2 comma 200 here the value of register r2 along with the immediate operand value 200 is added and saved into the register r2 itself so going by the options option a that is option 1 and option 2 both are correct so the correct answer is both 1 and 2 this is a previous registro question statements associated with registers of cpu are given identify the false statements option a the program counter holds the memory address of the instruction in execution option b only opcode is transferred to control unit option c an instruction in the instruction register consists of the opcode and the operand option d the value of the program counter is incremented by 1 once its value has been read to the memory address register so going by the options let's first of all check option a program counter should actually hold the address of the next instruction to be executed here what is mentioned is that program counter holds the memory of the address of the instruction in execution this is actually false so option a is the correct answer this is a previous registro question which of the following affects the processing power assuming they do not influence each other one database capability two addressing scheme three clock speed so one database capability yes if a bus size is increased then we can have more words fetched in a single cpu clock cycle this can ultimately affect the processing speed so option 1 or this option is correct now option 2 addressing scheme different addressing scheme have different execution time but ultimately it does not affect the cpu's processing power so this is not a factor and three clock speed definitely clock speed can definitely affect the processor's processing power so option 3 is also correct and going by the options option b 1 and 3 only is the correct answer this is a previous registro question convert the prefix expression into infix so here we are given a prefix expression and we are asked to convert it into infix now let's see how to follow a procedure to convert it so the given prefix expression is minus star plus a b c star minus d e plus f g now we'll reverse the expression from right to left in the reverse order so the expression will be resulting as follows g f plus e d minus star c b a plus star and minus now we have to follow two rules while converting this into infix expression if a symbol is being get then we push it into the stack now if we find an operator we top the top two operands from the stack and then we create a string of the form operand 1 followed by operator followed by operand 2 and we again push it into the stack so going by these two rules let's parse the expression from here to here in this format and push it into the stack as we see g we push g into the stack we are pushing g into the stack now f is followed so g and f is the second one now we are seeing an operator we are in currently here so we are seeing plus so we pop the top to f and g so f would be the operator one operand one and operator would be plus and g would be the second operand so f plus g 
this will be pushed into the stack f plus g next we are seeing e and then we are seeing d so here e will be pushed then d will be pushed onto the stack so right now we are here next we see a minus so we pop the top two operands and then form a string of this format and then we push it into the stack the next one would be f plus g then d minus e next operand is star so we pop the top two operands and make an string in this format and we push it back to the stack so that operation would be d minus e star f plus g this is how it would look like now we are pushing the next operand when we see it so the inside expression is d minus e star f plus g and we push c b and a onto the stack in this order c b and a now we are seeing a plus symbol we pop the top two operands here and we push it back to the stack so the stack would look like this d minus e star f plus g and once we push these two into the stack we will having c and on top a plus b next we are seeing star so these two operands would be popped out and we will get the following expression that is a plus b star c and the next expression would be d minus e star f plus g now we see minus so we pop these two operands and push the next operand into the stack that is a plus b star c minus i'm writing the next remaining part here d minus e star f plus g so this would be the final expression so the final expression would look like something like this a plus b star c minus d minus e star f plus g now going by the options none of these options are matching here so a b c d all the options are not matching so the correct answer is none of the above but this is actually a mistake given in the options so none of the options are matching none of the options are matching so if you find such questions and if you are having doubt do not try to waste too much of your time if you are having doubt in the question since we are having only 90 minutes you move on to the next question don't wait for answering a single question it will be a wastage of your time this is a previous ristro question consider a five segment pipeline with a clock cycle time of 20 nanoseconds in each sub operation find out the approximate speed up ratio between pipeline and non pipeline system to execute 100 instruction if an average every five cycles a bubble due to data hazard has been introduced to the pipeline so consider the time without pipeline time without pipeline we have number of instructions into stages in pipeline into clock cycle time per stage so in total we have 100 instruction 5 stages and 20 nanoseconds so this is equation number 1 now time without pipeline in time without pipeline we have two components that is time for pipeline execution plus overhead due to stalls overhead due to stalls this is time with pipeline time 
with pipeline. So the first component we have n stages, so 5 plus 100 instructions minus 1 into 20. This is the time for pipeline execution. So this component overhead due to start. Let's see how we can calculate. Here we have a bubble every 5 cycle and total 100 instructions are there. So on an average 100 by 5 we have 20 stall cycles. So in total for 20 stall cycles we have 20 into 20 nanoseconds overhead. So this is the total time with pipeline. So we have when calculating 5 plus 99 that is 104 into 20 plus 20 into 20. Taking 20 as common we have 20 into 124. So this is point number 2. Now previously we had noticed that the speed up ratio is as follows that is ratio of time without pipeline pipeline by time with pipeline without pipeline we had 500 into 20 and with pipeline we had 124 into 20 so solving we will get 4.03 so option b is the correct answer Consider a 32-bit processor which supports 70 instruction. Each instruction is 32-bit long and has four fields namely opcode, two register identifiers and immediate operand of unsigned integer type. Maximum value of the immediate operand that can be supported by the processor is 8191. How many registers the processor has? The important points to note here is that instructions is 32-bit long, four fields of opcode, to register value and an immediate operand of unsigned type and the maximum value of the immediate operand is 8191 so let's draw the instruction format the first field is opcode second field let's denote r1 as the first register identifier r2 as second register identifier and the last value would be the immediate operand immediate operand and the instruction size is 32 bit. So let's try to fill in the values. Here we are given 70 instructions. So the opcode bits would include log to the base to 70, which is 7 bits. So here we have 7 bits. And 8191 is the maximum value. To represent 8191, we require log to the base 2 of 8191 which is 13 bits so 13 bits are here so we have to calculate these two values which are unknown so from 32 we have 7 plus let's denote one register identifier bit as x so similarly this would be also x so 7 plus 2x plus 13 so 32 minus 7 minus 13 equal to 2x we have 12 equal to 2x x is equal to 6 so we have 6 bits here and 6 bits here so with 6 bit we can identify 2 to the power 6 registers so we have 64 option b as the correct answer This is a previous year ISRO question. In a 8-bit ripple carry adder using identical full adders, each full adder takes 34 nanoseconds to compute the sum. If the time taken for 8-bit addition is 90 nanoseconds, find the total time taken by each full adder to find the carry. So the total time to calculate is given as 90 nanoseconds. This is the total time or total delay. And the delay for each sum identification is given as 34 nanoseconds. That is sum delay. And n is equal to 8. So the formula is total delay is equal to sum delay plus 
n minus 1 carry delay. Plugging the values 90, 34, 7 into carry delay. So carry delay is equal to 90 minus 34 divided by 7 which is equal to 56 divided by 7 which is equal to 8, 8 nanoseconds. So option D is the correct answer. This is a previous resource question. We are given a multiplexer circuit and we are asked to identify what the circuit is equivalent to. So we have two input select lines A and B and the expression can be as follows A bar B bar C plus A bar B C bar plus A B bar C bar plus A B C. Now taking out the common factors and rewriting it we can rewrite it as follows C bar into A bar B plus A B bar plus C into A bar B bar plus A B. So this can be written as C bar into A X or B plus C into A X or B the whole bar. So this is of the format A bar B plus A B bar which implies is equal to A X or B. So A X or the B term would be A X or B. So this is the final expression. So this is equivalent to the sum of a full adder as well as the difference equation of a full subtractor. So both options A and D are correct. So sometimes when such question comes it's better either to select one option. This is a previous restore question. A stack organized computer is characterized by instructions with A indirect addressing, B direct addressing, C zero addressing and D index addressing. So first of all what is stack organized computer? A stack organized computer is characterized by zero address instruction which will perform operations on top elements of the stack. For example an add instruction for two operands will pop top two stack elements, add the operands and then push the results back to the stack. So option C, zero addressing is the correct answer. This is a previous ISRO question. A computer which issues instruction in order has only two registers and opcodes add, sub and move. Consider two different implementations of the following basic block. And case 1 represents the one implementation and case 2 represents the other implementation. Assume that all operands are initially in memory. Final value of computation also resides in memory. Which one of the following is better in terms of memory access and by how many more instruction? This question lacks clarity on how add and sub operations are executed. It is not mentioned if it requires both operands to be in register or only one operand in register and other in memory or any other form. So let's be flexible and assume that either both operands has to be in register or only one operand has to be in register and, me and memory or both can be in memory. And let's perform the following. So let's consider a comparison table. So we'll construct a comparison table to identify each cases. Case 1 and case 2. First of all, we'll move R1, comma A. We are implementing this case now. Move R1, comma A. Next is add R1, comma B. Add R1, comma B. So we are performing the first case or the first instruction that is T1. Now we'll move R2, comma C. Move R2, comma C. Next one is add R2, comma D. Add R2, comma D. The next case is sub R2, comma E. We are implementing E minus R2 or E minus T2 here, this instruction. Next one is sub R1 comma R2. This performs T1 minus T2. Now as the final result has to be in memory, we are moving this R1 to memory. So this case 1 is implemented. Now let's go into case 2. First instruction is move R1 comma C. Next step is add R1 comma D. Next step is move 
R2, comma R1. We are moving the value of R1 to R2. The next step is sub R1, comma E. This performs E minus T2, this instruction. The next step is move R1, comma A. Next step is add R1, comma B. This step is done. The next step is sub R1, comma R2. Now we have to perform one more instruction. That is the move instruction. Move R1, comma memory. So case 1 is better than case 2 by one move instruction. Let's see if we have any of the options as below. Case 2 is better than case 1 by instruction. No. Case 2 is better than case 1 by 3 move instruction. No. Case 1 is better by 2 move instruction. No. Case 1 is better by 3 move instruction. No. So none of the options matches. And the correct answer is case 1 is better by 1 move instruction. This is a previous ISRO question. Which one indicates a technique for building cross compilers? Beta cross, Canadian cross, Mexican cross or X cross? So first of all, what is a cross compiler? A cross compiler is capable of creating executable code for one platform other than one in which it is executing. Example, a compiler runs on a PC but generates code that run on Android smartphone. This is a cross compiler example. Now, Canadian cross is a technique for building cross compare for other machines where original machine is much slower or less convenient than the target. So the correct option is option B, Canadian cross. This is a previous year stroke question. Consider a two-dimensional array X with 10 rows and 4 columns with each element storing a value equivalent to the product of row number and column number. The array row major format is stored. If the first element x00 occupies the memory address 1000 and each element occupies only one memory location, which all locations in decimal will be holding the value of 10. So the points to note here are, first thing is row major form. And the value of a particular location is the product of row multiplied by column. So we have an integer array. Assume it is an integer array int of x 10 comma 4. So there are 10 rows, 4 columns and the indexing is at 0 comma 0 and it is stored in row major form. So first row would be stored here. And subsequently second row subsequently third row and so on so row 1 row 2 row 3 etc and we have four columns 1 2 3 4 here also 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 this index would be 0 comma 0 because indexing starts at 0 so for row 1 column 1 indexing is at 0 comma 0 this is the important point and this memory location would be 1000 now the question that we are asked is to find the product so 10 is possible only when we have 10 into 1 or 1 into 10 or 5 into 2 or 2 into 5 we have 10 rows and four columns only. So assume this as row and this as column. This is a possible combination. This is not a possible combination. This is a possible combination. This is not a possible combination. So only two combinations are possible. Row 10, column 10, column 1 and row 5, column these are the possible combinations. Now, the another important point to note here is that since it is in row major form, let's calculate the address for an element stored in row major format. Suppose x of m comma n. This is the x, x comma n. This is the row and n is the column. 
the basic formula is base address plus n minus lower bound of row lower bound row into number of columns plus m minus lower bound of column the whole multiplied by size of each cell size of cell this is the basic formula now plugging the values we have two values that is 10 comma 1 and 5 comma 2 so 10 comma 1 can be stored at location x of 9 comma 0 since indexing is at 0 0 row 10 will be at index 9 and column 1 would be stored at index 1 so the basic formula would be 1000 plus 4 minus 0 into 4 plus 1 minus 0 the whole into 1 which would equal to 1017 and the second one would be stored at x of 4 comma 1 that is row 5 would be stored in index 4 and column 2 would be stored in index 1 so we have 1000 plus 9 minus 0 into 4 plus 0 minus 0 the whole into 1 which would give us 1036 so in these memory locations that is 1017 and 1036 we can have the value of 10 but none of the options are matching so none of the options is the correct answer and this is a question which was excluded from evaluations so in sometimes what can happen is such erroneous questions can come so we should we should not waste too much of time if you are not able to get an answer we should move on to the next question this is one important aspect of writing and clearing the isro paper this is a previous isro question the post order traversal of a binary tree is given and the pre-order travel is what using binary tree with just one traversal we cannot create the other traversal we always need in order traversal along with post order or pre-order to calculate so if it was just a binary search tree then with post order traversal assuming that in order traversal results in a sorted order we could have created a pre-order traversal but we cannot assume such thing because here it is explicitly mentioned that it is just a binary tree and not binary search tree so none of the options actually matches here so it is better to leave such questions if you have doubt this is a previous year isro question in linear hashing if blocking factor is denoted as bfr loading factor is denoted as i and file buckets n are known then the number of records will be and options are given so first of all what is blocking factor blocking factor it is the number of records in a block number of records in a block this is the sense in dbms concept now what is load factor load factor load factor is the number of keys associated with each cell or bucket with each cell or bucket now the blocking factor can be estimated as the number of buckets in each block that is the concept we are using here so it is number of buckets in each block each block this is the blocking factor bfr and the load factor is denoted as i so total number of buckets total number of buckets is total number of buckets are bucket in each block that is the blocking factor 
BFR into number of buckets. Number of buckets. That is N. Now, total records is equal to total records is equal to loading factor into total number of buckets. Loading factor is denoted as I into number of buckets. This term. Number of buckets is equal to BFR into N. So, the correct answer is L into BFR into N. That is option D. What is compaction refers to? And options are given. So, first of all, what is compaction? It is the process of combining all empty memory partitions together to create a bigger partition. And why is this compaction useful? It is used to solve the problem of external fragmentation. What is external fragmentation? External fragmentation is the situation where sufficient memory is there to satisfy a process request, but it cannot be allocated due to memory block not being continuous. So consider a situation. Suppose the memory is divided into different blocks. That is block 1, block 2, block 3, and it is of variable size. We have 10 KB here, 5 KB here, 20 KB here, and 55 KB here. And this block as well as this block is being occupied by a process. Now, another process comes whose requirement is 25 KB. We cannot allocate memory here because if it is continuous allocation, the block size should be greater than 25 or equal to 25 to allocate. But here we have only 20 and here we have only 10. But total size of memory that is available to us is 30 KB. But we cannot allocate a process request of 25 KB. So in compaction, we copy all the free memory spaces together to a single location. So in compaction, this 10 KB and this 20 KB would be combined and a new partition of 30 KB would be created here. So using this, we can allocate this 25 KB. So compaction is used to resolve the technique of overcoming external fragmentation. Option C is the correct answer. This is a previous ISRO question. The operating system and other processes are protected from being modified by an already running process because option A, they run at different time instants and not in parallel. False. They are in different logical addresses. This is also false. They use a protection algorithm in the scheduler. This is also false. Option D, every address generated by the CPU is being checked against the relocation and limit parameters. Yes, this option is correct. So what is relocation register? Relocation register is used to protect the user process from each other from changing the OS code and data. So we have a base register which contains the smallest physical address and limit register contains the range of logical address and each logical address must be less than the limit address. And this is used to protect the processes being modified. So option D is the correct answer. This is a previous year ISRO question. G is an undirected graph with the vertex set V1 to V7 and edge set as shown. A breadth first search of the graph is performed with V1 as the root node. Which of the following is a tree edge? First of all, let's construct the graph based on the edges and vertices. V1 is the vertex 1, then V2, then V3, then V4, V5, V6, and V7. Now let's draw the edges V1 to V2, V1 to V3, V1 to V4, V2 to V4, V2 to V5, V5 to V6, V4 to V5, V6 to V7. Now breadth first search uses Q data structure. BFS uses Q data structure. Now suppose V1 is the root node. Now the traversal involves there is also edge V3 to V4. Now, one form of traversal is let's draw all the edges for which V1 is connected. V1 is connected to V2, V3, and V4. So we have V2 here, V3 here, and V4 here. Now, assume V2 is the first which is pushed to the Q. Now, let's draw all the edges which are connected to V2. V2 is connected to V5. V2 is connected to V4, but we have already V4 here. Now, V2 is also connected to V1. We have V1 here. So, after V5, V5 is connected to V6. So, we'll draw V5 to V6. 
then v6 is connected to v7 so now all the edges are all the nodes are visited this is one traversal and the form of traversal is we taking root as v1 we have v2 as here then v3 as here and v4 as here now using v4 as the node we can get v5 v6 and v7 now considering the options v2 v4 the options are given as v2 v4 that is one option v2 v4 is definitely not possible the another option given is v3 v4 that is also not possible but we can have v4 v5 as well as v1 v4 v4 v5 is possible in this traversal only v4 v5 is not possible in this traversal so v4 v5 is also not considered and the last option is v1 v4 v1 v4 is present in this traversal as well as v1 v4 is present in this traversal so option b v1 v4 is the correct answer this is a previous year history question if the array a contains the items 10 4 7 23 67 12 and 5 in that order what will be the resultant array a after third pass of insertion sort so first of all what is insertion sort insertion sort is a sorting algorithm in which the values from the unsorted part are picked and placed into the correct position in the sorted part so in insertion sort the array is divided into two halves one is sorted half and the other is unsorted half so let's consider the elements 10 4 7 23 67 12 and 5 after the first pass what happens is 10 and 4 is compared and 4 is not in the correct place so it is placed in the correct place as 4 comma 10 now the array is divided to two halves that is sorted and unsorted this would be the sorted half now there is no need to move the 4 further so this will be the array this will be the array after first pass now in the second pass 10 and 7 are compared now 7 is less than 10 so 7 is placed in its correct position 4 comma 7 comma 10 now the array is divided as it is 23 67 12 comma 5 in the third pass 10 is compared with 23 and 10 is less than 23 so it is in its correct position so there is no need to change anything so 4 7 10 23 67 12 and 5 this would be the third pass and this would be the second pass now the question is what would be the resultant array after the third pass after the third pass we have 4 7 10 23 67 12 and 5 and option b is the correct answer this is a previous year history question a half man tree is constructed for the following data and the data is as follows for a we have the frequency 0 0.17 for b we have the frequency 0 0.11 for C, we have the frequency 0 0.24. For D, we have the frequency 0 0.33. And for E, we have the frequency 0 0.15. And we have to decode the data as follows. 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. We have to decode this data. So initially to create a Huffman tree, we'll select the least frequent value and create a tree. And this cycle follows. So the least of the values that are present here are 0.11 and 0.15 and the least value would, would be the left part and the uh, bigger value would be on the right part so the initial first tree that we construct here is b and e and the values are 0 0.11 0 0.15 the sum would be 0 0.26 point two six. this is the first tree now we have the following values inside this that is 0 0.17, 0 0.24, 0 0.33, and 0 0.26. Now we select the top two smallest values, that is 0 0.17 and 0 0.24. They are A and C correspondingly. Now we draw the tree. We have the values as follows we have A here and we have C here. So the values are 0 0.17, 0 0.24, and the sum would be 0 0.41. This is tree number two and the, then the corresponding values that we have here is 0 0.33 and this value 
that is 0 0.26 and this value 0 0.41 and d is here and we next take the top two small values these are the top two small values so for 0 0.26 this tree that is equation one this tree would be the constructed one and d would be combined with it so let's draw the tree for that we will be having 0 0.26 here on the left hand side 0.26 on the left hand side and the other value of d that is 0 0.33 here this 0.263 is again as follows here yeah, that is we have b here and we have e here and the values are 0 0.11 0.15 so these two trees are combined and we'll be getting the following here that is 0.51 here we have 0.51 so the remaining values are 0.51 and 0.4 this value is actually 0.59 so we have 0.59 and 0.41 so let's draw those two trees and 0.41 tree corresponds to the equation 2 tree Please remember that. So we are drawing 0 0.59 tree first, 0 0.59, and here we have 0 0.26, here we have D, here we have B, here we have E. And the 0 0.41 tree is as follows. Here we have 0 0.41, and the values are A and C. A would be here, C would be here, and the values will be 0.17 and 0.24 and summing up we'll get a total value of 1 now the left uh, tree would be 0 or the left side would be 0 and the right side would be 1 so 0 0 right side would be 1 right side would be 1 and again left side would be 0 right side would be 1 left side would be 0 right side would be 1 now we are asked to find or decode the value of 1 0 0 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 so going by the tree 1 0 0 1 0 0 we are having this value as b next one is 0 0 0 0 we have a next is 0 1 we have 0 0 1 that value is c next here we have 1 0 1 1 0 1 this corresponds to e so the correct answer is b a c e and based on the options we have b a c e s option a so option a is the correct answer this is a previous year history question given the grammar s gives t star s or t t gives u plus t or u u gives a or b which of the following statements are wrong and we are given four options so let us derive some inferences from the given grammar one inference is star is right associative right associative why because star is to the right of the terminal symbol s now plus is also right associative because plus is to the right of the terminal t now the priority of plus is higher than that of star star is having less priority when compared to plus now one more thing grammar is not ambiguous because preferences are already defined grammar is not ambiguous now let's see the following options which of the following statements is wrong this is the question grammar is not ambiguous this statement is correct priority of plus is higher than that of star that is also correct right to left evaluation of star and plus happens that is also correct so none of the options is the correct answer this is a previous history question what is the time complexity of the following code and the code is given below so we have sum equal to zero and we have a nested for loop and the inner loop and outer loop are given and the outer loop is i equal to 1 to n i less than n i equal to 92 and inner loop is j equal to 1 j less than n j plus plus and sum plus plus which of the following is not a valid string first of all let's try to find out the time complexity of the code this statement would take order of one time the 
outer loop would run for order of log n time and the inner loop would run for order of n time and this would take order of one time so in total the time complexity would be in worst case order of n log n but the question here is very vague because they are asking finally for which of the following is not a valid string so one way of inferencing is that the worst case complexity cannot be beyond n log n so order of n square order of n log n log n then order of n log n and order of n this is the way in which it can be arranged in decreasing order so anyhow these three will be correct because it cannot be less than order of n log n so order of n is not a valid string that can be one way of an answer but uh, such question uh, should be ignored because the question is very vague this is a previous resource question which of the following is an efficient method of cache updating option a snoopy writes option b write through option c write within and option d buffered write so let's see each options option b write through it is a cache update protocol which updates or invalidates the shared data only if needed this protocol works via broadcasting hence it creates a lot of traffic so it is not efficient option b is not the right answer move on to option c write back protocol it is a cache updation protocol in which it is based on the ownership of the block this also uses broadcasting similar to write through so this also creates a lot of traffic so this is not the correct answer option d buffered write it is an updated form of write through protocol and uses broadcasting hence it is not efficient and let's see option a option a is called snoop writes in snooping system all caches on the bus monitor or snoop the bus to determine if they have a copy of the block of data that is requested on the bus also every cache has a copy of the sharing status of every block of the physical memory it has so as a result this is much better than the other three options for performance reason it is important to note that snooping function should not interfere with the normal operation of a processor and its cache so it is an efficient method of updating the cache so option a snoopy writes is the correct answer this is a previous resource question in a columnar transposition cipher the plain text is the tomato is a plant in the nightshade family and the keyword is tomato and the cipher text is what so first of all what is a columnar transposition cipher it is a cipher in which we write the plain text in rows and then reads the cipher text in columns one by one based on a particular order of the keyword here we read it based on the lexical graphic order so let's see how to draw the columnar transposition cipher and read the cipher text so here we have let's first of all draw the table based on the keyword here the keyword here is tomato so t o m a t o so then we draw the columns so let's draw the table here One, two, three, four, five, and let's write the plain text row by row. T H E the tomato T O M. So one row is completed. T O M A T O is i s a now we have plant p l a n t next one is i next one is n then we have the t h e then we have night n i G H T S H A. Let's draw the 
table a bit more. So shade is having S H A D E F A M I L Y. Now let's replace the blanks with X for the time being. X X X X. Now based on the lexicographic sorting order, A this column would be red first. Now next value would be M. Next value that would be O. So we have two O's here. O here and O here. So the left one would be given preference. So this would be three, and the right one would be given next preference. So this is four. Then we have T here. So left T would be given next preference that is five, and the next T would be given preference six. So we read it downwards. So from here in this order we read every column based on the preference. So from top to bottom. So the first cipher text would be T I N E S A X. This would be the first cipher. Now the next one would be based on M. That is E O A H T F X. Next one would be this one. That is H T L T H E Y. The next one would be this one. That is three are over. Next one is four. So this one. That is M A I I A I X. The next one would be the one which is five. That is this T A P N G D L. And the last one would be this one. We have zero. Actually, it is O S T N H M X. And going by the options, we have option A, which follows this. And option A is the correct answer. This is a previous restore question. Avalanche effect in cryptography refers to, and four options are given. First of all, what is avalanche effect? It is a desirable property in cryptography where a small change to the plain text or the keyword can cause a significant change in the output. That is the cipher text. And let's see the options. Large changes in cipher text when the keyword is changed minimally. True. Large changes in the cipher text when the plain text is changed. This can also be true. Large impact of keyword change to the length of the cipher text. This is not correct. Option D, none of the above. So option A will be more correct than option B because of the keyword minimal here. So minimal keyword is given. So option A would be more correct than option B. So option A is the right answer. This is a previous restore question. A magnetic disk contains hundred cylinders, each with ten tracks of ten sectors. And if each sector is one twenty eight bytes, what is the maximum capacity of the disk in kilobytes? So the formula to calculate the maximum capacity is number of cylinders multiplied by number of tracks multiplied by number of sectors per track per track into size of sector so we have 100 into 10 into 10 into 128 divided by 2 to the power 10 since we are trying to find the capacity in kilobytes. So we have 10 to the power 4 into 2 to the power 7 divided by 2 to the power 10. We have 10 to the power 4 by 2 to the power 3 which is equal to 1 to 50 kilobytes. So option C 1 to 50 is the correct answer. This is a previous restore question. How many total bits are required for a direct map cache with 128 KB of data and one word block size, assuming 32 bit address and one word size is of 4 bytes? So we are given the data is of 128 KB. This is the cache size. And block, at, block size is given as block size is equal to one word 
which is equal to 4 bytes. Also, main memory address is given as 32 bits. So, using this, let's calculate the tag bits. So, here we have a 32 bit address. So, tag offset, the line offset, and the word offset. So, word offset is 4 bytes. So, 2 bits are sufficient. Also, we have number of lines that can be calculated as 128 KB, which is the total cache size, divided by 4 bytes. This gives the total number of lines, which is equal to 32K, which is equal to 2 to the power 15. So, the line offset is 15 bits. So, tag will be 32 minus 15 minus 2, which is again equal to 15. So, this is the tag bit. Now, total tag memory size. Tag memory size can be found here. Tag memory size. This is equal to number of lines in cache memory. Number of lines in cache into tag space in the line. Into tag space in the line. In line. This is again is equal to 2 to the power 15 is the total number of lines in cache. 2 to the power 15 into tag space which is equal to 15. This is point number 1. Now the next point that is total cache size. Total cache size is equal to tag memory plus data memory data memory so we have already find out the tag memory that is equal to 2 to the power 15 into 15 plus data memory is given as 128 kb plus 128 kb converting everything into bits 2 to the power 15 into 15 bits plus 128 k into 8 bits so we have here 480 k bit this can be calculated to 480 kilobits plus this can be calculated as 1024 kilobits which is again equal to 1504 kilobits which is equal to 1.5 megabits so option d 1.5 megabits is the correct answer. This is a previously restore question. Properties of delete and truncate commands indicate that and four options are given. So first of all, what is delete? Delete is a DML command and DML commands are used to manipulate the data that is present in the database. Example, insert, delete, update, etc. Second one is truncate. Truncate is a data definition command and they are used to define the database schema. Some example includes create, truncate, etc. So, delete is a DML command and it can be rolled back, whereas truncate is a DDL command and it cannot be rolled back. So, option A, after the execution of truncate com operation, commit and rollback statements cannot be performed to retrieve the lost data, while delete allows it. Yes, this option is correct. Option B, after the execution of delete and truncate, operational retrieval is easily possible for the lost data. This is not correct. Option C, after the execution of de delete operation, commit and rollback operation can be performed to retrieve the lost data while truncate does not allow it yes this is also true option d after the execution of delete and truncate operation no retrieval is possible for the lost data this is not correct actually both options a and c are correct in this question checksum field in tcp header consists of and options are given actually checksum in tcp header consists of the three important points first one is the tcp header The second one is the TCP body or the data and the third one is some of the bits from the IP header as well. This is called as pseudo header. So some bits from IP header or also known as pseudo header. So Taking the sum and finding the ones complement, 
this is how the checksum field is calculated in tcp header so option b once complement sum of header data and pseudo header in 16 bit words this is the correct answer this is a previous reserve question if x plus 2y equal to 30 then calculate 2y by 5 plus x plus x by 3 plus x by 5 plus 2y by 3 so let's calculate 2y by 5 plus x by 3 plus x by 5 plus 2y by 3 so we have 6y plus 5x by 15 plus 3x plus 10y by 15 recalculating we have 16y plus 8x by 15 now taking 8 as a common factor from here 8 is taken as common factor 2y plus x by 15 we have 2y plus x equal to 30 so 8 into 30 by 15 cut shorting we have the answer 16 so option b is the correct answer this is a previous year stroke question for the distributions given below and two distributions are given distribution a and distribution b and we are asked to find which of the following is correct about the distributions and four options are given some of the points to remember here is that the standard deviation doesn't change standard deviation doesn't change when the graph is shifted to left or right shifted to shifted to left or right and also it doesn't change when it is rotated at any point rotated at any point remember these two points now if you look at the graph we can observe that distributions given in the question the spread of the graph has been rotated from 30 so at the point 30 if you see both these graphs now this distribution has been shifted to here and similarly this distribution has been shifted to here so we can say that the spread of the graph has been rotated from 30 so as per the definition given here the standard division doesn't change when it is rotated at any point so it has been rotated here at the point 30 so option c standard deviation of a is same as standard deviation of b is the correct answer as there is no change in the standard deviation of both the distributions this is a previous reserve question the hardware implementation which provides mutual exclusion is a semaphore b test and set instructions c both options d none of the options so first of all what is mutual exclusion mutual exclusion is a property of the process synchronization which states that no two processes can exist in the critical section at a given point of time so this is what critical section means now going by the options option b test and send instruction is definitely a hardware implementation but regarding semaphores semaphores requires kernel support to make p and v operation atomic but hardware support isn't essential but the only point to note in semaphore is that both p and v operations must be inducible so either it can be done through hardware implementation or through software implementation so option b is the correct answer this is a previous resource question what is the output of the following c code assuming it runs on a byte address little engine machine so the important point to note here is little engine machine what is a little engine machine it is an order in which the least significant bit is stored in the lower level address so that is little engine machine and the code is given below so we have an integer x and a character pointer ptr also one other important point to note is that the associativity of the comma is from left to right so when x is being stored 622 100 and 101 x will have only the value 622 and the binary representation of 622 is as follows 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 this would be the first byte 0 1 1 0 1 1 1 0 now as we know in little indian machine the least significant bit is stored in the lower level address so suppose this is the binary format in little indian machine it will be stored as follows and that is 0 1 1 0 1 1 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 this is how it is stored this would be the first byte this would be the second byte now 
x will be having the value of 622. 622 mod 3. Let's calculate. 622 mod 3. We have 2, 0, 0, 0 here and 22. 2. So we have 7 here and 21. So 1 is the reminder. So x mod 3 would have value 1. Since we have explicitly typecasting it, the value of x into a character pointer or character. So we have only one byte storage here. So the first byte would be only stored here and this value is 110. So the total value that is printed here is 110 into 1 which is equal to 110. So option D is the correct answer. This is a previous ISRO question. We are given a 32 bit machine with a 32 bit compiler and there is a C code given and we are asked to find out what is the output. So first of all let's go into the main function. We had two variables var1 and var2. Let's assume the addresses are in the order of 100, 200, 300 etc. Now var1. Var1 is having a value of 5 and it is stored in memory location 100. Second one is var2. It is having a value of 10. It is stored in location 200. Now there is two pointer variables. PTR1 is a pointer variable which is storing the value of var1 and the address. So we have 100 here. It is storing the value 300. PTR2 we have it is storing the memory address of var2. So we have 200 here and this is value 400. Now we are calling the addresses of PTR1 and PTR2 to this function. So in this function scope, we have PTR1 and PTR2. So here initially it will be passed to PTR2. PTR2 will be storing the value of 300. This is stored in memory location 500. And PTR1 is storing the value of location 400. And it is stored in memory location 600. Now the next step is there is one more pointer variable ii. ii storing the value of ptr2. The value of ptr2 is 300. This memory location and it is stored in memory location 700. Now the next step P, uh, ptr2 will be storing the value of ptr1. So ptr2 will be storing the value of ptr1. Here we have value 400. The next step is ii value will be stored onto ptr1. Here we'll be having value 300. The next step is ptr1 equal to ptr1 into ptr2. So ptr1, what is the value of ptr1? ptr1 is having value 300. So it directly points to here, the first pointer. Since it's a double pointer, the second pointer will be point to the value here. So we have var1 is equal to var1 into ptr2. ptr2 is having value 400 so it will be point to here and the second point is having 200 so it will be point to here. So var1 equal to var1 into var2. So here we have 5 into 10 which is equal to 50. So now we have var1 is equal to 50. Now the second statement that is ptr2 equal to ptr2 plus ptr1. So ptr2 is actually var2. So var2 equal to var2 plus var1. So we have value 50 plus 10. So here the value is 60. So var1 is equal to 50 and var2 is equal to 60. And the return values here are var2 followed by var1. Var2 is 60 and var1 is 50. So option D is the correct answer. Option D is equal to 60,50. This is the correct answer. This is a previous ISRO question. We are given a pseudocode and we are asked to find out the cyclomatic complexity. First of all, what is cyclomatic complexity? It is defined as the quantitative estimate of the number of linearly independent paths in a code. Also, it is calculated using the control flow graph of the program. Some of the important points to note here is that if the code does not have any control flow statement, then cyclomatic complexity is 1. If it has an if statement, then there are two possibilities. Either it can be true or it can be false. So the cyclomatic complexity, cyclomatic complexity is 
2. Also, for while loop, the cyclomatic complexity it is 1. Now, moving on to the pseudocode, we have two while loops here while loop 1 and while loop 2. So, for while loop, the cyclomatic complexity here is 2. Also, we have an if statement. So, the cyclomatic complexity for if statement is also 2. So, the total cyclomatic complexity is 2 plus 2, which is equal to 4. So, option C, 4, is the right answer. In a class definition with 10 methods, to make the class maximally cohesive, number of direct and indirect connections required among the methods are. First of all, to make the class maximally cohesive, every method should be related to every other method. That is an important point. Hence, if we assume every method to be a node of a graph, like this, or suppose there are four methods, we assume every method to be nodes of a graph. Then, to be maximally cohesive, every method should be connected to every other method. So, the edges represents the connection and nodes represents the methods. So, the maximum cohesiveness can be achieved by making the graph complete. So, we have this as a complete graph. If you assume 4 here. So, the number of direct connections here is nc2. If n represents the number of nodes, then among every two nodes, we have to make a connection. So, we have n into n minus 1 by 2. This is the formula for having the class to be maximally cohesive. So, n is equal to 10 here. So, we have 10 into 10 minus 1 by 2. We have 10 into 9, 9 by 2. We have 45. So, 45 should be the number of direct connections and to make the cohesiveness maximal, the number of indirect connections should be 0. So, the correct answer is 45,0 and option B, 45,0 is the correct answer. This is a previous RISPRO question. Of the following, which best approximates the ratio of number of non-terminal nodes to the total number of nodes in a complete K-array tree of depth n? So, for depth n number of internal nodes and the total number of nodes follow this pattern for depth 0 we have internal node and total number of nodes as 1 for depth 1 we have number of internal nodes as k and total number of nodes as k to the power n plus 1 which is equal to k square for depth 2 we have k square here here will be having k to the power 3 so similarly for depth n we have k to the power n and here we have k to the power n plus 1 now, following the count of total number of internal nodes, we have number of internal nodes is equal to 1 plus k plus k square, etc. k to the power n. So, this is of a geometric progression and the final result would be k to the power n minus 1 by k minus 1. Now, number of total nodes total nodes is equal to 1 plus k plus k square plus etc k to the power n plus 1 so this is also of a geometric form so the final answer will be k to the power n plus 1 minus 1 by k minus 1 this is equation 1 and this is equation 2 so the ratio will be 1 by 2 that is is equal to number of internal nodes number of internal nodes divided by total nodes total nodes so we have the formula k to the power n minus 1 divided by k minus 1 the whole divided by k to the power n plus 1 minus 1 divided by k minus 1. So, cutting these two, we will be having k to the power n minus 1 divided by k to the power n plus 1 minus 1. So, which will be approximately 1 by k. So, the correct answer is option C, 1 by k. This is a previous RISRO question. A grammar is given here and it is defined as follows. And the question is, the non-terminal alphabet of the grammar is so first of all what are non terminal alphabets 
set of all non terminal symbols are those from which all the strings in the language can be derived by applying production rules and these are the production rules here all the non terminals are present on the left hand side of the production yes using a we can derive bc and b we can derive x or bx c we can derive b or d d we can derive y or ey e we can derive z so a b c d e all are non terminals so a b c d e option a is the correct answer this is a previous reserve question if a equal to a equal to x y and z and b is equal to u v w x and the universal set u is equal to set of s comma t comma u v w x y and z we are asked to find out a union b complement intersection a intersection b so first of all let's find out b complement b complement is the set of s comma t comma u comma v comma w x y z minus whatever is given in b that is u v w x so this is equal to s t y z so this is b complement now in the question we have first to find a union b complement we have b complement is this and this is a so we are finding the union means we have s t x y z this is a union b complement now the next point is a intersection b we have x only in a intersection b and the question is a union b complement intersection a intersection b so this intersection this we have only x in this so this is the correct answer but in the options this x is not given so none of the options matches here so none of the options this is the correct answer should be but the options mentioned here is not matching with the correct answer this is a previous reserve question consider the following circuit and the circuit is given below we are asked to find out the function by the above network so let's split the functions one by one here the output will be a b the whole bar because this is a nand gate here the output will be c plus d the whole bar because this is a nor gate the output here would be a b the whole bar into e the output here will be e into f the output here would be f into c plus d the whole bar so the three inputs are here and here we have a nor gate so let's calculate the final result we have a b the whole bar into e that is this part plus e f e f plus e f is this part plus f into c plus d the whole bar the whole bar because of nor gate now expanding we have ab plus e bar because now we are expanding this not operation here so we have this not and this not get cancelled and here dot will be plus and e will be converted to e bar followed by dot followed by e bar plus f bar followed by f bar plus c plus d this is upon simplification the next step would be a b e bar we are multiplying this term with this term so we are ex expanding a b e bar plus a b into f bar plus e bar plus e bar f bar multiplied by 
f bar plus c plus d again expanding we have taking e bar as common from this we can rewrite it as a b f bar plus e bar into a b plus 1 plus f bar into f bar plus c plus d this whole term would be 1 so rewriting a b f bar plus e bar into f bar plus c plus d so going by the options it is option b that is e bar plus a b f bar into c plus d plus f bar c plus d plus f bar so option b is the correct answer